let's very quickly review again uh, the course handouts. I believe you're all familiar with the course uh, Petroleum Engineers for them. This is the only geophysics course they, or course they take into in their career. It's a very important course for the petroleum engineers, for ge geologists uh, from, uh, I believe, uh, degree 2000 onwards, we introduced two new geophysical courses. One of them is wheel logging in geophysics. The other one is exploration geophysics. Exploration geophysics is taught this semester the first time, but uh, for the new uh, cohorts, it will be a core course in their degree plans. So this is actually the first geophysical course they take. Even the geolog geologists themselves, this is the first course. We are trying to modify it a little bit. No, sorry. <laughs> this is data processing. Anyway, I think I have the, the course outline as well in here. Slide show, start from the first slides. Yeah, that's better. So this is the first course for geophysicists. And I found that the geophysicists themselves, they struggle a bit, especially if competing against petroleum engineers for some reason. It wasn't the case the last, at least the, during the online teaching, for some reasons. I don't want to go to the details, uh, but I believe the, the type of assessment wasn't quite fair for all the students. Some students were solving the final exams in groups, whereas the others, they are totally dependent on themselves. So they, the, the, the way of assessment online is not very fair. And uh, it affected the grades for the last semesters overall, not in my course. In all the courses I went through, I found that the grades were below expectation, way below expectations. In general, as I stated again, the course is very important. So don't get um, at some point that the course is heavy, it should be heavy. It should be heavy because the only course, only geophysics course you take in your curriculum. So before I proceed, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, some of you are familiar with me. Uh, some students I supervise act as their academic advisors. My name is Khalil Houthi. At one point in my life, I was in your place. I was a student. I graduated in 2000, uh, almost 2009. I joined the SKU in 2010. Since then, I was a demonstrator for two years. Then I did my master in uh, Imperial College London, I returned back. I worked for two years in here in SKU as a lecturer. Uh, when I was a demonstrator, I'm not allowed to teach uh, courses by myself, but uh, I was helping other instructors in their courses or the lab components. However, when I was a lecturer, uh, I was probably very productive. I, I was teaching three different courses at the same semester. so. <laughs> This is a large overload for an instructor, even for someone who is uh, not, is like uh, an assistant professor. Right now, I'm an assistant professor. And I did then my PhD in University of Bristol, back again in, uh, in uh, UK. Uh, Bristol is a city at the west of UK, small city, beautiful city. Uh, it's almost like a university city, the two big universities apart from that. There are a lot of small universities and colleges. Uh, it's good for learning English if you have kids and you have a lot of money. If you want them to go and spend their summer there learning English, why not send them there? In, uh, during the summertime, you'll find the city is crowded with foreigners, especially whom, especially Chinese. Chinese are everywhere there. Everywhere you go, you'll find that those are Chinese trying to get the language, learn the language, English language. English language is universal language, almost. Most of the sciences developed in the English language. And we are teaching the course, this course, in English language. In seismology or in seismic in general, up until now, all the terminology are not have been translated to Arabic. 
most of the terminology are still in English language. This is very large number. Good. So this is me. I will be teaching this course. I taught this course. Uh, this is my fourth time. So I have good background about the course. Uh, about the office hours, there have been little change. So this course, just recently I moved it. Moved it. I made it from 12 to, to 2, exactly. And also for the other lab part. This is uh, another course, advanced course. Uh, it's called Seismic Data Processing. It's a bit, a bit advanced. This is your course, General Geophysics. Uh, you'll find, oh, this guy is, is free all the time. No, that's not true. I have uh, some master students. Uh, they regularly come visit me. And they also work in some projects. So this time, you, what you think I'm busy, I'm free, I'm totally busy. Uh, regarding the office hours, I made some slight changes. So my office hours uh, are two office hours from 9 to 11 on Monday and Wednesday. Regardless, if you have anything, send it to me by email. I will answer right away. There is a module. I prefer that the questions are asked in the module. So the, everyone benefits. When I answer your question, everyone see the, my answer or read my answer. So everyone learns from others' mistake or the sharing of knowledge is going to be widespread. Co Course description, uh, I will describe a little bit in advance the course uh, quickly. Uh, this is the first course you take, general geophysics. The expectation that you will be familiar with the geophysical methods. Uh, geophysist is a multidisciplinary subject as well. So myself, for example, I'm leaning toward seismology and exploration geophysics. I'm leaning toward what I call seismology in general. And that's the subject, somehow the subject I was doing in my PhD. When I was doing PhD, um, overall that the, the subject of the PhD was related to seismology and exploration geophysics. For example, have you heard of earthquakes? Any, any studies related to earthquakes, study of earthquake the terminology, the scientific terminology is seismology. Se seismologists are people who study earthquakes in general. So uh, I was having a project from PDU, and uh, PDU is operating an oil field. Uh, you know, once you start production, once start pumping out the oil, if it's in a reservoir, the reservoir should have some drive mechanism. The way the oil gets out of the reservoir, it should be through some drive mechanism. And uh, sometimes the drive mechanism is, the, is uh, usually water or uh, gas or whatever else. There are so many. I'm not a petroleum engineer, so this is not my subject. However, there should, the reservoir should maintain the pressure. There should be high pressure there for the fluid to get pumped up. And the oil at that specific reservoir or field is very heavy. Have you heard of heavy oil? Yes. It's the API of the oil is so heavy. It, it flows very slowly. Its viscosity is, so it's almost like if you want to soak some uh, juice, but the juice is so heavy. It's not very light, so you cannot suck it. How to light it, lighten it up? How to make it lighter? You either heat it, or in terms of the juice, you add water. So for the oil reservoir, to let the oil flow easily, as one of your colleagues, what's your name? Petroleum engineer? Geologist? Good. I, I, I used to remember all students' names when I was a lecturer. <laughs> but since the students are covering their faces, whenever I see them around, it's hard for me to recognize them. 
And uh, sometimes I, when I walk in Carrefour or somewhere, oh, you are my instructor. Oh, maybe, I don't know you. <laughs> so it's good to get interactions, ask questions. Uh, I try to remember, I just saw his face. So Safwan is a geologist, so it's good um, to have some interaction during the lecture. Uh, so as he said, we introduce heat. We heat up the rock to let the viscosity get lower, for to, uh, to get the uh, oil lighter. But when we are pumping at high pressure, we are steam injecting into the reservoir, we might create fractures or faults. We might create what? These are natu not naturally occurring. They are induced by human. They are fractures or faults which were induced by humans during operations. So what happens? Usually, whenever there is a fault, it's manifested as an earthquake. The energy travels, propagates in every direction. That's what we call an earthquake. The only difference between these two, between what I was studying and the large earthquakes, the devastating earthquake is magnitude. Large earthquakes, they have magnitude of six, seven, nine. Nine is really devastating, is destructive. Whereas the one I was studying, they have magnitude below zero, minus one, minus two. You can't sense them. Human can't sense them. The sensible magnitude for an earthquake to be detectable by human is three, probably around three. If it's larger than three, a human can detect it. A human can feel it. So that was my study in general. It's part of seismology. We'll have one chapter in seismology. Uh, we'll try to learn how, what's, uh, how an earthquake originates, where they originate, uh, how we can locate them. Uh, we try to measure their uh, magnitudes. What are the magnitude? types, that's one chapter, and we also have two different labs. One of the labs is trying to uh, determine where the location of the earthquakes are based on some measurements, basically, and the other lab is actually on determining the sense of motion. So faults, different faults, um, if, if it's an old fault and you, have, you are having a field exhaustion, you can't tell what is the type of the fault, reverse strike slip normal fault. However, if the fault is in the subsurface, there is no surface exposure of the fault, it cannot be determined. You cannot tell what is the fault type if it does not have fault surface exposure. However, seismic data, seismology data, can be used to tell what was the sense of motion. It was the two blocks. There is a block at one side, the other block on the other side. What was the sense of motion? Was that block moving up relative to other block or the other way around? That's what we call sense of motion. And seismological data can tell you such information. Actually, people recognize or understood what is the internal structure of the Earth interior based on solely seismological data. They know right now that the, there is an outer core, an inner core, a mantle, a crust, at what is somehow the properties of each layer based on seismological data. They were studying seismological data. Those data, they used it quite intensively, intensively to determine what is the internal structure of the Earth. In general, as I said, geophysics have different disciplines. Uh, we'll start with the most important one, which is seismic seismology first to introduce you to the seismic concept seismic waves wave types their velocities and etc then we do some practical part first of all is uh, refraction we study what's refraction then reflection and uh, for petroleum engineers this is the most important subject why seismic technique is actually the one used most often it's the pre predominant method used in oil industry. 95% of the time, seismic 
technique is the one used in oil exploration. Seismic, we need to differentiate between seismology and exploration geophysics, or exploration, seismic exploration. Seismic exploration, the depth of investigation is up until six kilometer, five kilometer, maximum probably 10 kilometer, but not beyond that. That's still the limit of Earth crust. However, for seismology, seismology, the earthquake data, they can propagate, hold the Earth interior. They can impinge into the interior of the Earth. An earthquake that might happen in Japan, if we have sensors here in Oman, we can detect them. So uh, that's what we call seismic and seismology. Then we deviate, study other techniques, graffiti. If I ask you, uh, what is the gravitational force? What is the value of the gravitational force? What's acceleration to gravity? What's the value of acceleration due to gravity? Nine. Is it a fixed value? Yes, it's variable. In schools, you uh, assume g is 10, or assume g is 9.8. In geophysics, it's changing. It's changing so slightly that we need very delicate, very precise equipment to measure those slight variations. So we need very precise equipments to measure those slight variations. And those small variations, local variations, are due to change in the density of the rocks. The rock's density is varying from one place to another place. Those variations could infer what are the top type of rocks, where I can find a higher anomaly. Uh, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, actually, what isn't there? He, uh, last week, end of last week, a geologist contacted me. He said, Khalil, you taught me uh, general geophysics. I'm a geologist, and actually I'm working in a company, geophysical company. They are doing mining. And uh, we are interested to find where are the ore's body of chromite? Where are the chromite located in the subsurface? He said, we conducted one of the methods, magnetic methods, geophysical magnetic methods. He said, it wasn't our company who conducted the survey. We contracted another company. The other company is an Omani company. It's owned also by graduates, skilled graduates. The, the boss or the head of that company is a geophysicist, but he has a lot of geologists too. He employed almost 20 students. He employed recently more. He employed more even because he got a large project in Qatar for three months, intensive work. And he employed geologists. And one of the geologists was just recently yesterday sent me an, a WhatsApp message, Khalil, I'm just doing what you taught me. <laughs> You see, this is the equipment you, you taught to me. I'm right now using it. So this is a good sign that even geologists, they are get, getting jobs in geophysics. So don't think that ah, this is irrelevant to my career life. This is why they added this course to my curriculum. It's a very important course. And actually, the geolo geophysicists themselves, they are no better than the geof geologists in the subject itself. If a, a geophysicist have no background knowledge in geology, he's of no use. He's of no use. And I tell you, there are some companies uh, in Oman, for example, CGG is a company doing seismic data processing. They usually prefer to employ physicists. Do you have any physicists here? Physics. Do you have any physics? So they employ physics. Not geophysicist, no geologist, but physics. Why? Because they, they think the word itself, geo, and also physics. Which one is the bigger word? Physics. <laughs> Geology is the three letters only, whereas physics is the full word. I say, oh, let's take the other part, physics. Because in general, geophysics is the knowledge you gain in Geophysics is the knowledge you gain, or the principle of physics applied to geology. Magnetic field. 
gravity field, waves, seismic waves, how they travel into the, in the interior of the East. They are all relevant actually to physics rather than geology, but we use them to infer the geology, the geological information, the layering of the Earth, the types of rocks. Good, so these are some uh, uh, discussions. And uh, there is a means, one of the means he says that an instructor was teaching geologist, geophysist, and a petroleum engineer. And the question was two plus two, what's two plus two? Four. When uh, the petroleum engineer answered the question, he said four. Whereas the geologist, you know what he said? He said could be three to five. The geologist said what? It could be three to five. Huh? Whereas the geophysist, what he said, what do you want it to be? You want it 10? Make it 10. Zero, make it zero. It's your desires, whatever you like. That tells us to what we call uncertainties, limitations. Geophysics have some limitations. Geophysics, because in geology, I can go to the extent of eating the rock. Oh, this is, this is not a limestone. This is a salt. <laughs> they go to that extent. They test the rock sample. Whereas geophysicists, they're looking blindly without seeing the rock. That's a fourth dimension, probably. You are, you are sending some waves to the ground are receiving the response. What that response is? Uh, what kind of rock is that? So which one you think has a higher uncertainty? The geophysicist or the geologist? Yeah. Geophysicist has higher uncertainty. Petroleum engineers, they see the logs. They see probably the pressure data. They should give right answers, correct answers. But they can go wrong. They can go wrong <laughs> sometimes. And they depend on geologists. They also depend on geophysical data, in, in at least in oil industry. Without having knowledge at all about pressure, other data, they can't do anything. From where they get the pressure data? Usually from either geological data or geophysical data. Seismic, if you don't have a will, seismic could help you to get pressure information. Seismic itself can give you pressure information. So geophysicists, they, they gave us the data, and they, because petroleum engineers, usually they have equations. Equation can either be right or wrong. But uh, yeah, in geophysics, interpretation varies a lot. If I give the same data to one person, he says, no, I think it's like that. Going back to the students who contacted, my la contacted me last, uh, yesterday, I I forgot to respond to him, so he contact, called me. Khalil, I contacted you, you didn't respond to me. He said, fine, what's your question? What do you want? How I can help you? He said, two companies conducted geophysical magnetic survey in the same site, looking for comite, and the results are totally different. How can that be? The interpretation, final conclusions for the same data is totally different. And we drilled based on their information, we found nothing. Your subject is useless. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> Actually, I said I cannot decide unless you give me the data, you tell me how they acquire the data. I do, I draw my own interpretation. Maybe some of them, they didn't, some of the surveys was having something wrong. You conduct the survey in wrong manner, everything is wrong. That's taking us back to the, the course outcomes, course objectives, to learn how to conduct geophysical survey. How to go to the field and conduct geophysical survey. And by the way, we'll have some field works. Uh, we'll come back to that later. There is a textbook for the course. It's one of the simplest textbook. Uh, myself, I don't like textbook they, which have a lot of text. I write them to be, I want them to be into the point and some equations, simple equations, not very difficult um, mathematical equations. This is good. This is one of the best books uh, in general geophysics. 
And uh, not every chapter is included, not co cover every chapter. And whenever I discuss some chapter, I refer you to the page numbers there in the book. And for the same chapter, you'll find that I'm excluding a large number of pages. And since I'm trying to modify, I always modify both my lectures slightly and also my exams. The students who take me, took with me courses, they find that no, the, the exam was totally different. And I give them the, the previous year's exams. And I will give you the exam I conducted last semester for the final and the midterm. I think midterm, they already have it. But the final, they still don't. I haven't provided to the students. So this is a good book. My recommendation, if you have time, read it. But you will be given uh, the handouts. And if you want to secure high grade, uh, you can depend totally on the slides. However, for geophysicists, any geophysicist around? Who is a geophysicist? Geophysics. There are a couple of geophysics. So for them, it's, it's highly recommended that you go read the book. And there is no better way to improve your speaking English is speaking, except read a lot. Read a lot. Keep reading. And what's the best thing? To read something you are risk required or asked to perform good. The reason your family sent, me, sent you here is to perform good, to get the good grades, um, bring satisfaction to yourself and your family, make them proud of you. And be proud yourself of your accomplishments. So that's the book. Assessment, uh, I think I made some modifications. But let's go back to the same uh, assessment components. And I uh, would like to, to conduct four quizzes. And the students last time, they said, uh, take the best three. So we'll take the best three out of four quizzes, the total of four quizzes. The quiz is going to be during lecture time, the same time as Sunday. Uh, we have practicals, weekly practicals, not starting from this week, but from the next week. There is a practical, practical on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday during lab times. There is a group project. There is a group project. A group project is going to be similar to the project uh, students, petroleum engineers work in their FYB, FANA project. FANA uh, petroleum engineers next year I believe they take this course while they are in their fourth year. So next year, they take a, a, a final project. And it has two components. First component is building a static model of the year. It's totally related to geology. Most often, it's related to geology. The next component, which, what they do in this semester, it's full year. First semester is static model. The next semester is dynamic modeling, how to do build a dynamic how to run production and make forecast how much you produce uh, out of the earth of oil or either gas. Uh, that's in the second year. This is totally away from our subject. It's going to be advanced, totally advanced. So we'll not cover that one. We'll do only static modeling. That's independent. And you will work in teams of 10 person in a team, in a group. We, I have, I believe, 61 students. So they're going to be total of how many groups? Six groups. Each group, there are six students. And um, I prefer to distribute them myself because uh, I want to make a mix of geologists, petroleum engineers, and geophysics. Lubing is not allowed. Making a lobby of geophysicists, geologists, that's not permitted here. Yeah, uh, let's, let's make it a mix of different uh, disciplines so they learn from each other. And also I try to make it a mix of uh, students who are in their fifth or fourth year. Also, geophysicists usually they join right away in their second or third year they take these students. So their overall knowledge is a bit limited compared to graduate students or students who are about to graduate. So my question was, oh, so we'll have also midterm, 25%. Final exam, uh, 45%. And field work. We either make one or two, dependent on what? On the availability. Sometimes our request, our request to transportation department, they get refused. 
they get because they say we have limited resources. And you know that uh, this is a big department. We have a lot of courses. It's a geology. Geology cannot be a geology unless they do a lot of field works. So I try to make it two. However, if for some reason I cannot secure transportation, we'll make it only one. And the timing will be decided soon. The first one is week five. It's very close, almost three weeks from now. Huh? Any question? Um, this is not uh, a holy book. And I want to get your feedback. What do you think of the grading scheme, the assessment components? Yes? HV? Yes, that's going to be out of 40. That's what we agreed on. I just wanted to repeat myself again. That's going to be 40. And this one? Nine. Yeah. The five mark will be moved from final to the field work. Uh, still haven't been decided. I was discussing with another instructor. They said, oh, two field work for introductory course. It's a bit too much. But uh, believe me, petroleum engineers, they enjoy the field work. And when I taught this course a long time ago, I attended their uh, the last graduation ceremony. And most of the photos were from, with, from the field work they conducted with me. <laughs> and I believe they, they didn't go for field uh, during the corona. Am I right? So it would be a nice option or nice uh, learning process to apply the science you learn get application part right away. Uh, I will bring other students, uh, graduate students will be helping us uh, conducting the field work. So <laughs> I was teaching this course the last three semesters. This is uh, when Corona started, Corona, and we went to the lockdown process. Huh? So see what is, what's happening, what's the percentage of A and B? 767, oh, uh, 76. It was a bit large, it's good. So and the performance was good. The last, not the last, before the last semester, still good. Then uh, I haven't made, uh, I mean, distinction between male and female. Female, somehow, I'm not sure they perform better than males. <laughs> Could be. Um, uh, last semester, the last semester, 18 students in our department went to probation, first probation. This is a shocking noise. It wasn't only with me. I, I was having 26% A and B, percentage of A and B. And this is after boasting the students, rising the scale a bit high. So uh, the scheme, grading scheme I used, for example, for this year was 90 and above, A. Then an increment of four. Four, yani, uh, that's um, 90 and above A. Uh, decrease four, you're going to be A minus. Again, decrease four, you're going to be B plus, and so on. Whereas for this year, last semester, I decreased it. I made uh, A lower than 90. And also increased the increment. Instead of using five, I used four. If I keep the same increment, this, the width, this high would have been here. This high column C would have reached or came here. And there was the, the highest grade wasn't obtained by petroleum. There were few number of petroleum engineers in the first semester because they go according to their curriculum, and their curriculum states that they have to take it in their fourth year, second semester, spring semester. So the, the one, the, is she a male or female? Or he? What do you think? Well, is she a Jew, uh, not a Jew physicist? Neither geologist, nor a petroleum engineer? Physicist. The one got physicist. And, huh? So the maximum war mark was uh, 72. In the final, she got 70. And whenever you have such case, you have some students performing very good, other students performing really bad. Someone is giving you the paper empty. You 
can't help. How I can, how I can give one or two if the paper is empty? <laughs> it's solid zero. So your range of from F, battery is low. Oh, I forgot to switch on this one. What's happening? Mm. Good. But hopefully, this semester again we go up. We go again up. I uh, hope uh, the percentage of A and B going to be again large. So probably this semester was one of the highest, the instructor with the highest percentage of A and B also this semester. Whereas this semester, believe me, there were other instructors uh, from College of Science, no A and B. Um, maybe the department, the college asked them, oh, could you increase a little bit the percentage of A and B? Could you boost the students? Why are you failing them all? <laughs> so that's how uh, the grading, I couldn't help much because students, they need to help themselves. If you ask why, what's happening, what was the reason of this astonishing or shocking results, uh, I believe online. I blame the online. Students get used to the online system for two years. They thought the exams are still the same way conducted, I have an open book, I don't need to study a lot, I can refer quickly to the exam, uh, that's not the case. This is totally different. Uh, on campus examination, you should read or study more, probably. And I give you the exams, the final exams for all these three years or semesters. You will come yourself to the conclusion that this was at least easier than one I gave, easier than one I gave to the students in this year. And uh, many students they came to my office, um, uh, raising the question, Khalil, I'm not agreeing with the grades. I said, oh, "That's your uh, paper. Review it. You have it." He, he has taken with me uh, the other course. What is the other course? Earthquake, Earthquake seismology, the other course. He got good marks, still he, he went to a higher mark. Said, review your paper. He spent almost 10 minutes trying to get a mark here or here or here. <laughs> so that's how the grading scheme goes. Uh, objective, I can go past this one. Uh, tentative schedule, uh, I think there is no better than, than instructor himself to structure the course itself. I have sent you this uh, tentative schedule. In general, we'll start with seismology. We will have weekly labs. The main change I'm making this semester compared to other semesters is that the labs will be conducted here during lab time. Not necessarily this same hall, but the, lab, the, the, the hall will conduct or have our lab sessions. I believe it's in D, probably. Huh? I think they are in D. Both of them, I think they are in D. They move to D. The room is small, but um, sometimes we need computers. So I secured statistics, a lab in the statistics department, a big lab with computers. The other one for Tuesday, it will be on Digital Lab. Have you heard of Digital Lab? It's a lab in our department with a good facility, computer facilities, very good performance computers, PCs. So that's not always. That's only when we have a lab that requires you to use probably a computer, a software, using, for example, Excel, or making some maps using server program or any other programs, geophysical specific programs. You are not here to code for me or write your own program, no. You are still introductory level. Even graduate students here, they don't write their own codes, except the other course I teach. There is a course, uh, so said geophysical data processing. I ask the students, write me a code, does that, that. So the, that's advanced level course. 
Here I give you a ready-made software. You need to use it to get some results. Good? And if you, I think uh, the one who is a geologist or geophysicist, this is an ideal time to be a geophysicist or uh, an over-related discipline. Why? If you have a chance to graduate, graduate right away. Graduate within the next year. Don't delay anymore. Don't stay here for longer. If you are trying to get secure yourself a job, this is a good time. Oil prices are going up. They are in good profitable margin. They will start employing. They want the prices to stay as they are for a couple of months, for three probably or more than a couple of months, five, six months. Then they will have confidence that the price is stabilized. We can hire. We can hire uh, extra students, more students. And, they, and that's what I felt. Students who graduated last semester, uh, many of them, they uh, secured job in oil industry. They start initially with Medlogars. Have you heard of Medlogar? Medlogar is, uh, is a geologist, usually sits uh, where the drilling go, happens. Um, when they drill, the drilling bit cuts the rock, and there is a circulation, the pump water through the pipe to let the cutting come out. The geologist, the, youth, the geologist will, uh, Medlogar, he takes samples right away to make a log. Oh, this was sandstone, this was limestone, this was at what depth? Before they run wire lines, before they send some instruments into the wheel to apply to do geophysical measurements. So the mud logger is the first guy who, I got this rock, let me see what kind of rock is that. That's the mud logger. A lot of them, uh, it's not a uh, complex job yet. Uh, it's demanding, and you can go really higher and higher in positions. So all companies nowadays, uh, nowadays even um, what's happening, uh, yeah, start stopped following me, tracking me, because it senses my hands. I should not raise my hand a lot. Make this stops. Ah, it stopped again. Yeah, it's following me. So remind me that I don't raise my hand, otherwise it stops. So uh, uh, oil companies, mineral exploration, as I said, mining industry is booming in Oman. Uh, the, the company, the guy who sent geologists abroad to Qatar for three full month work, um, it's a mining job. They are doing some mining, some kind of mining, site characterization, uh, for example, uh, I believe you have heard of uh, some many projects, Blue City Project. Have you heard of Blue City Project? It's in Sawadi. They wanted to build a resort, beach resort, big resort. If you go to Sawadi, you'll find the Blue City. Have you ever been to Sawadi? I'm from there. So uh, it was a bit filer. The reason being is that the, the sand there is not stable. Whenever you want to build some long story, large story building, you should make your foundations into the bedrock, into the hard rock. In a coastal area around uh, Batna, the topmost layer is soil, is unconsolidated rock. So whenever an earthquake probably happens, the most, God forbids, the area which will be or destructed a lot or uh, uh, a lot of damage happens there is in Batna coast because the sand is not stable. It might sink. The buildings, they can't sink. Whereas in, in uh, many places in Masqat, uh, the homes were built on hard foundation. That's what we call site characterization. And believe me, in civil engineering, they contact, us, contact our department a lot, a lot. Oh, could you do some geophysical analysis for us? I remember I did a project in uh, library. I did a project in library, and uh, the objective was what uh, there is a court building, a building uh, 
that court is there. And they, st they have a basement, a floor below the ground, and water started leaking through the sockets. The water what started leaking through what? Sockets. It's not only the, uh, the, the court building, also the hospital suffers from the same problem. So what they thought, they thought that the water from down below the water column or water table is rising up. That's not true. That's not true, that's not what I found. What I found that the topmost layer is a wadi channel, a wadi sand. It's gravel, wadi gravels. What's the porosity of wadi gravels? High. They are high. And they were built on top of these wadi gravels. And below that, there is a hard rock, impermeable rock, a rock which does not have any permeability or porosity. And when they irrigate the gardens around, the trees around, the water table start rising, rising. Not the water, because the water cannot penetrate, go deeper. Go deeper into the deeper layers. The rock is impermeable. And I, I said, oh, could you stop irrigation? Let's see what happened. After just a couple of days. Yeah, the trees got dried, but you stopped what? The leaking, water leaking into the building. That's a geophysical project. That's, yeah, I don't do it free. I say, <laughs> if you are the ski even, give me my money back. <laughs> I need, yeah, that's what the companies do. And we use those um, the money from those such projects to, to buy new equipment. What they do again, this is some figures, geophysicists trying to find where, for example, this area where uh, oil or reservoir can be. This is uh, where they try to find where the water table is. Site characterization, that's what uh, I talked about. Want to build a long, large story building, you need to do site characterization. Archaeology, we do a lot of archaeological studies using some technique called GPR, ground penetrating radar. It gives you a detailed image of the subsurface. Uh, yeah. It might go up until five meter, four meter, but during archeology, span you cannot do excavation. You cannot bring a bulldozer to, because archeology span usually we are interested in very, very valuable things under the ground. At an old tomb and some, some old thing. So we use uh, geophysical investigations. In, uh, in um, there is a city in Nez nearby Nezwa. What's Bahla? Sorry, in Bahla, yes. Hassan Salut. Have you heard it? Heard of it? So where is it? It's in Bahla. And uh, they found that, that there, uh, there was an Omani civilization older than the, the Pharaoh's civilization. Ahramat Lif Masab. It is, and they we used uh, used geophysical measurement, GPR, to trace to trace the very old village system. The village system is older than even the pyramids in Egypt. Without digging, without excavating. Very quickly, make a quick survey, try to trace where the village system is. And when we dug there, when we confirmed that this is the village system, whenever there is, I'm not expert in village system, but uh, there is some block where the water comes and the channel goes. You got the point? And a hufra hufra kibira shwaya. El maid yamma fi, but then yimshi it harak mathan of akta mantiga. And we dig there and we found very old, ancient ornaments. Hassan Nashia, Jid and Jidna Kadima. So, geophysical techniques, let's see how much time. Yeah, we still got some time. Um, any questions before we go forward? Any questions related to what we have covered so far? Again, I say something. I want to cover as much as possible. I don't want you to finish this course unless you get bored from me, probably. <laughs> Hopefully, you won't get bored. So my plan is to cover as much as possible. 
And uh, the floor is open if you want to ask questions, whatever time. Right now, during the lecture, or when I go back to office. I will enroll you to the module soon. I will send you the key, uh, enrollment key, maybe tomorrow, day after tomorrow, or today, probably. Uh, I was really busy. That was the first time I acted as timetable officer in the department. And some students visited me. They saw me very, very busy. Uh, I was managing all the overloads, student registrations, timetabling, everything. So it's a bit tedious job, actually. Um, going back to the lecture notes, geophysical methods in general can be categorized into two different categories. One of them is called active techniques. The other categorization is passive technique. And the way we categorize them is the nature of the source. What is the source? What sends the signal? What, for example, for this, what vibrates the ear? Is it a man-made or a naturally occurring phenomenon? In case, if it's a man-made, we categorize the technique as an active method. Whereas if it's naturally occurring, then we consider that technique as a passive. For example, my question, what do you think about graffiti technique? Where you, it's a passive technique. It's a passive technique. Why is that? Because the source itself, the graffiti fields, is naturally occurring. I'm not inducing it. It's not induced by humans. The same is true, for example, for magnetic technique. Seismic, seismic. The source could be a hammer. I hit for seismic refraction, for example, during our field visits, I will ask someone who is, maybe you, I think, I think you are the strongest in here. <laughs> What's your name? Shaker. 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 So maybe we'll give you the hammer, you hit the ground, but be gentle on the ground. Don't create an earthquake. So uh, that's an active method. This is an active method because the source is a man-made source controlled by human. Usually these techniques are more expensive. And they are labor intensive. Why is that? Because I need someone to hammer. Whereas for graffiti, for example, for graffiti, one person is enough. Practically, one person is enough to conduct graffiti survey. I take the equipment, I will show you the equipment, and you walk around. Put the equipment down, few minutes, you get your results. You get a graffiti acceleration at that specific location. So in general, we have active and passive, and they're subcategorized as such based on the source. Seismic is an active. There is a method where we inject a current to the ground. We inject what? A current to the ground. What do you think about this method? It's also an active method. It's also an active method. What do you think about earthquake? Is it? It's a passive. Yet it's seismology, seismic technique. However, it's a passive method. It's naturally occurring. It could be, yes, in that sense, if, for example, if I'm, as I explained earlier to you, I'm injecting steam into the ground, into the reservoir, I might induce a fault. I might create a fault. Usually, whenever there is a fault, an old fault, and I start injecting something along the plane of this fault, I might lubricate it, and then any pressure might reactivate the old dormant fault. For example, in dams, you know what's a dam? Sad. It's a dam. We are constraining, we are restricting the flow of water. We are uh, making a large reservoir. The weight of this reservoir is so big, 
so large on the ground, it might activate what? Old faults. For example, the said, uh, what they call it, the largest said in Wadi Dika. It's one of the largest dams in Oman. And they, they deploy seismic sensors there. They have seismic sensors around to measure any small shaking of the ground. And suddenly they release the pressure. They release the water, let it go. Let the water go because I release the pressure on the ground. I might activate an old fault. That's referring back to the question he asked. Yeah, I can induce an earthquake, but it, it's most often it's naturally occurring. Most of the earthquakes are naturally occurring. So these are geophysical techniques. Uh, that's how we do geophysical analysis. This is a marine survey. And the technique I'm using here is seismic, seismic, seismic technique. In general, geophysical surveys are what I'm using, trying to use physical quantities to induce what is the internal structure of the earth. What are the different rock types? So I send a signal to the ground and I try to get the response. While there could be some noises, there could be the signal I'm getting back, it might be contaminated with noise. For this, this simple schematic diagram, don't go to the details for the timing. I have a source. So this is what kind of uh, technique? Is it active or passive? It's active. I'm, I'm injecting the source. I'm creating the source. A human is creating the source. The source in this sense is just a blast. That's a blast. You create a pressure in the, ground, in the sea, and the waves, they travel down the air. They travel everywhere. They travel spherically every direction. However, I'm just showing some few lines. That's how they travel. They hit the seafloor, and they hit one of the layers. For example, in this layer, there is some very important property. This property should exist, otherwise geophysical methods or geophysical acquisition is useless, is of no use. There should be a change, a difference in physical quantity. Variation, that word is very important. There should be variation in, did I send you this slide? I think so, am I right? Yes, so maybe from next week onward, your number is so large, they will not agree to print for all of you probably. <laughs> yeah, let's see how it goes. Huh? Maybe, maybe, let's see. So uh, there should exist a variation. For example, in seismic technique, the velocity of waves in this rock should be different than the velocity of waves in the other rock. Other, otherwise, they will, they will go down without getting reflected back. What the other thing you observe? This is the, that's a ray. That's a ray. It travels. What happens at the boundary between the sea and the sea bottom? Refracts, it's def deflects. That deflection is telling me that there is a change in property. It's similar to the light you send, am I right? Whenever it goes from one medium to another medium and there is a change in physical property of these two mediums, it changes its path. Changes its path. The same happens here. And right now I have some sensors lie down on the bottom of this of the sea, sea floor. They are recording back the upgoing energy, the re reflecting energy. And I, I can use this one to deduce what are the what is the internal structure of the earth? What, what are the different layers I see? So if you see the layer, you can tell where the oil could be. Good? This is a geophysical analysis in general. And 
In term of stage or steps, usually geophysicists follow this workflow. They start with planning. You plan. You have some idea. There is an issue, geological issue, or petroleum engineering problem. Geophysicists can help. Then you take your equipment, go to the field, what we call field acquisition. That's the first step. So that's the reason I, I tried to conduct some field surveys for you. Then what we do, we do some data reduction. Data reduction means that I'm converting the raw reading, which are meaningless, to some meaning, meaningful thing. One of the examples, uh, gravity field of the Earth. Have you heard? Do you know gravity field of the Earth? It varies, as we said, varies from one place to another place. Is it, is it always constant in the same? It's supposed to be constant in the same place because the geology within one hour or within five days or even within years, 10 years, seven, would the geology underneath will change? It's the same geology. So the, the gravity field at that specific point will not change. However, it changes. It changes for other external reasons. One of the external reasons is earth tides. You know, the earth tides, we might, will, yeah, the gravity field will change. Is that a geologic reason? So that's why we do data reduction. To remove anything non-geophysical, non-geological reasoning. Keep only the thing brought from geology itself. The geology in some place, the gravity field in some place, same exact place, should not change should not change because the geology heaven will not change in one year even, or five years. Whereas the, I'm observing some change, those changes are non-geological reasons. So that's what, why do we, then we do signal and noise removal. We keep the signal. We try to keep the signal. For example, when we'll do seismic refraction, we'll do seismic refraction, seismic method in general. You will notice that even someone is, Speaking, the sensor will know, will sense that. Balik, what do you think then if someone is walking? That guy is, that's the source. He's hammering. I should listen from that exact location. However, some is, when someone is jumping, which one is signal and which one is noise? The signal, the jumping is the noise. Whereas the signal is the one sent by the hammer, someone hitting the ground with a hammer. That's the signal. It's very important to understand the, the noise itself more than the signal sometimes. If you know the nature of the noise, you can remove it. Metal virus, what's the virus? You will be infected by the virus. If you have a immune system, they know what's, oh, that's not, that's not something my, should be in my body. That's a virus. Let's attack it. So understanding even the noise is very important. Not necessarily only I keep an eye on the signal. No, both of them are important. Uh, sometimes it's hard actually to remove some types of noise. In this stage, we do go at more advanced level, do data processing. That's the course I teach, seismic data processing. Not necessarily in data processing, I'm, I'm reviewing noise. I'm making more enhancement in data processing. I make it easy for geologists to understand. Geologists don't want, oh, what was seismic velocity? Oh, seismic velocity, what, 2,000? What's that? Tell me what's the rock type. I don't care about the seismic velocity. <laughs> That's what the geologists say. They, they want simple models, simple results. Oh, that's the rock. I have two different rocks. So this is one of the stages. Then once you complete this stage, you do modeling. Model is simplification of the reality. It's a model, namudaj. It's not the real thing. And no one can model the Earth exactly, precisely. No one. Neither geologist, geophysicist, or anyone can bring a real, exact model of the Earth. Even the Earth structure, as we say, crust mantle, it's not very exact. There are variations within the crust. 
They are variation within the mantle. That's a model. That's a model brought from geophysical data. Someone later comes, he might modify the model. Once there is better techniques, better data, more um, that data with higher signal than noise, he can bring a better model. And that's the reason, could be, could be of the reason that geologist who came to me and asked why Khalil I have two different results. Why? He basically they made a simplification or simple model of the ear. Oh, the chromite at that depth probably. Maybe they acquired better data the next time. Maybe the spacing of the data is, and you take measurement here, the next measurement, very close to the old, you are, the sampling, spatial sampling is smaller. We'll not, we'll not go to the details, but that's. Then visualization. Visualization is presenting the results, giving the results in good way. Scale is very important. Color is very important. Some students, they are colorblind. They are colorblind. So they can't differentiate easily. So make your results very fascinating. I did my training in Oxy. And usually the geophysicist, when they, uh, you know, if you do your training in, uh, probably, I'm not sure you are aware of that or not. Uh, in Oxy, uh, by the end, they ask you to present everyone, every intern uh, who joined the, the program, he, he or she has, is asked to present his results. And geologists usually, they come with the nicest, geophysicists, sorry, with the nicest figures, models, color, scales, where someone from, they even take from economic, only numbers. <laughs> What's that? Geologists, they can even create some good models. Petroleum engineers, Excel, oh, relationship. <laughs> That's how they look like, if you compare them. So making good visualization is very important. You cannot go to the next step. You cannot make good interpretation if you cannot visualize the data in good way. Geologists, there are some students who go to, uh, to do field mapping. And by the end, they need to field mapping is a course in ge geology. They need to bring a uh, good structure, good image, good uh, models of the earth. If their sketch is not good, is meaningless, is not easy to understood or understand, we cannot do good geological interpretation. So data visualization is very important. And once I created the good visualization, oh, geologist or petroleum engineers and the geophysicist, these are the data. What do you think are they? So the, it's very important that the geologists agree with your interpretation. Sometimes uh, you might come as a geophysicist to uh, some conclusion which is, which is geologically implausible. Yani, and that's one of the reasons. Yani, in Peru, for example, who do seismic interpretation? They are not geophysicists. What do you think they are? Geologists, they prefer geologists to work as seismic interpreters in PDU. Whereas Oxy, they prefer geophysicists. They know, they say geophysics, they appreciate the seismic data more than the geologists. It's the contrary in PDU. PDU says, no, with geophysicists, they can process the data. They can go through all these steps. Once they reach this step, here the geologist mind should work. Yani, there might be a fault, it's not plausible. There could be a fault, and it's possible to be a fault for a setting, geological setting like that. An extensional, an extensional setting, a drifting setting, there should be normal fault. All the normal fault usually in drifting setting. But geophysicist, he does not know this knowledge. Think, oh, there are reverse fault. That's not possible. And geophysics should not come with unrealistic uh, um, results. And velocity cannot go, go to 20 kilometer per second. There is no rock of velocity 20 kilometer per second. 
You're asking, oh, people, I made my interpretation. I see a rock having a velocity of 20 kilometers per second. That's unrealistic. Go do back your job properly. You don't want to be fired. So that's one of the reasons PDU prefer, for example, geologists to act or be working as seismic interpreter in contrary to PDU or to OXY. Data acquisition, that's a simple schematic diagram or diagram of uh, data acquisition in oil industry. That's a sand dune, what you see there. Uh, this is a tuck. If you click on this link, it takes you to YouTube. You can watch this video yourself. This is a tuck, what we call a vibrator. It shakes the ground, shakes the ground, sends energy to the ground. So this is the source. That's the source in this. This is what, what, uh, what stage is that? What stage? Data acquisition. That's the first stage. For all industry, that's how the survey is conducted. You go to the field, you take a lot of uh, vibrators. That's one of them. This is one vibrator. These are other cars just monitoring the work. They vibrate the earth, sends energy to the ground, and they will be detected by sensors deployed somewhere else or nearby. So this is the source, and that's the technique we use, or that's the tool we use in land. Can I, can I use the same in marine? No, vibrator can't be used. So there are other methods, other sources, type of sources in marine. I don't want to go into the details. So here is again the, uh, the sch uh, schematic diagram. I have a source, a vibrator, shaking the ground. This is another truck a recording truck, what it has, what it lies down on the surface? Sources, uh, sensors. These are sensors, seismic sensors. The energy goes everywhere down, reflects back, and get detected by these sensors. You will find that the energy is traveling everywhere, even, even there is an air wave, direct, and what? What this could be considered, the airwave, is it a signal or a noise? It's a noise. It's not coming from the ground. That's a noise. You need to remove it. If you can't remove it easily, you need to do some seismic data processing. One of the steps. steps we. So these are some types of noises. And uh, we usually use the vipro size. If the area is accessible, a car can go, but if it's, uh, the train is uh, harsh, uh, it's difficult to move a truck there, a seismic vibrator, then we use something else. We use dynamites. In Oman, rarely dynamites are used, but they use them a lot in some areas, uh, in other areas, especially in uh, areas where there is a lot of forests. And uh, every, if each thing has advantage and disadvantage, I will not go to the details, but Vipro size is, uh, is one of the best choices for land seismic survey, doing seismic survey in the land. Don't be, don't be fighting it again because of something you might think it's advanced. This is just an introduction. We'll study these things in more detail for example, seismic reflection or seismic vibrator in the chapter of seismic reflection technique. Uh, so that's how is it. This is the vibrator itself. And the system here, we call it a vipro size. The system itself is called a vipro size. Data acquisition yet again. So whenever I acquire a data, especially passive technique, for example, graffiti technique. Graffiti technique is... Uh, I take measurement in every point. Every point is one point, one D point. So these are points. Uh, my plan is to run my lines, take the measurement in a direction which is orthogonal, perpendicular to the feature I want to detect. I want to map. I want to delineate. If you are trying to delineate a fault like that, it's bad to plan your acquisition parallel to the fault. To do graphic survey parallel, not do it traverse or orthogonal or perpendicular. 
to the to the fault line. If it's a fault line or if it's a dike, this could be also a dike. You know what's a dike? Yes, geology one, I believe you studied dikes. So it's good to run these profiles in these orthogonal directions, traverse directions. So each point here, this is a station. Station, station, station. This is what we call stations. That's one, one profile, that's what we call a profile, or a traverse. So you, if you do many things, one, two, three. If you do one line only, you are doing what kind of survey? If you do one line, is it 1D, 2D, 3D? Hmm? One line. One line on the surface. What? Is it 1D, 2D, 3D? 2D. It's 2D. Why is that? Because you are almost getting, you are slicing through the earth. You're getting a, you are cutting like a cake into half and you see the structure. You're slicing, getting a slice of the ear. But if you acquire more than one line, it means you are, what kind of survey are you doing? 3D. The earth itself is a 3D. It's good to conduct 3D. But yeah, there is always some limitation. One of the limitation is time, expense. You don't have much time, why you should stay there? Or expense, if you don't have the enough budget, just do 1D. So this is a, a graph T survey. And in this simple dike case, the dike itself is called the target. The target body, that's the thing I'm trying to find. That's the target body. Whereas the rock surrounding the dike is the host rock. And there should be a physical variation. For example, for graffiti, what is the physical variation should be? What's the quantity I'm trying to measure for uh, graffiti? Density of the rocks. Dense, how dense you are. Maybe you will find someone who's fat guy, but he does not wait a lot. It's all air <laughs> inside his body. <laughs> Maybe you find someone who is very slim, but spoon is so tough, so dense, he weighs a lot. He weighs a lot. So that's density is the parameter we are trying to measure. If there is no variation in density for the case of gravity at least, I don't get what I call anomaly. I will not get an anomaly. That's the anomaly means this is where I'm running like that. The geophysical measurement here are different than the surrounding because the density of this dike is larger than the host rock. The target body has a higher density than the surrounding. So for chromite, for chromite is high density, for example, the guy who was looking for chromite, graffiti is one of the good technique. That was my suggestion. He said, Khalil, what do you think can we do to get better data, to get some good correlation. I said graffiti could be a good choice. Simple to acquire, easy, cheap. Just go and do graffiti survey. Chromite has a high density. Then we come to the point of data reduction. So we acquire the data. I give, I go back, that's the graphimeter. This is the one we have in our department too. That's a graphimeter. So one of, the, one of the problems, for example, if uh, this is the real surface, that's the real surface. I'm trying to find this target, this dike. I believe I'm doing graffiti, for example. I believe this target or dike has a higher density than surrounding. Yet, when I do graffiti survey, that's the response I get. The graffiti value is high, decreases, decreases, increases a little bit, then decreases again, then increases again. Why it's higher in here? What do you think? What's the reason for the high graffiti value? Yet, this is the same rock, 
with the same density. Dip. That's the elevation. What happens to the graft if you go closer to the earth? If, what happens to the graft if you keep away from the surface of the earth? It decreases. It decreases. So the gravity here is higher because I'm closer to the center of the earth. I'm closer to the center of the earth. I'm moving away from the center of the earth. The gravity is decreasing. I'm climbing a high mountain. The elevation will decrease the amount of gravity. The higher elevation you go, the density is the same, but the gravity value is lower. Do you think this topographic variation, is it really of geological interest to you? Huh? Topographic, surface topography, is it of really telling you something about the earth, the rock in the, in the subsurface? Topography. Topography, that's a topography. It easily can be mapped. We don't need geophysical survey to map the topography. So this, we have to reduce, to remove this effect. We have to reduce the effect. We'll go back to detail. How the data reduction for the case of graffiti can be performed. That's one of the examples. Another example, tides, ear tides. Tide will let the graffiti value in the same point to change two times. I'm measuring the same point. My this equipment is at specific point, yet I observe change in the graffiti value at different times during the day. What's happening? Tides have an effect. Is the tide also graph, uh, a subsurface uh, thing you are trying to measure or trying to deduce? No, it's not of geological interest to you. So you have to remove it. Such removal, we call them what? Data reduction. That's the data reduction. So we try to remove things which are not predictable. That's, is that clear? Any questions? Anomaly. So my final outcome is usually an anomaly. I want to get something different. So there should be a variation in the physical property, either graffiti, density, sorry, or uh, for example, in magnetic, we, magnetic we call it susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. In seismic refraction, we call, uh, we, we are interested in change in velocity and density, and so on. For example, in resistivity technique, we are interested on, on change of resistivity of the earth, conductivity of the rocks. Conductivity of the rocks. Could you name me a wind logging measurement which reads resistivity variations? No. Resistivity logs. Resistivity logs are a log we run along the. So we conduct also resistivity on the surface of the earth to measure the variation resistivity. It's very useful to measure or to deduce where is the water. Water table. Where is the water table? Um, so anomaly is uh, anomaly is the final product you get. It's a, some something abnormal, something different than the surrounding. That's what we refer as the anomaly. So for this example, that's my profile. I run a line. I took measurements along a line. That's the gravity values along the line. I did data reduction to remove the effect of topography. So what happened? That's what I observed. That's an anomaly. It's different than the surrounding. That anomaly is produced by what? By that target dike. That's the dike. So anomaly is very important in geophysics. And not all methods usually deduce anomaly. And you are not interested always in anomaly. For example, seismic, yeah, you get layering of the earth. So there not, they're not, might not be an anomaly. Whereas for magnetic, for gravity, anomaly is very important. 
By the way, you hear what I say? You might get surprised that I bring questions in midterms, exams, to, from what I say during lectures. Quizzes. So it's, it's good to either play back the video, you have the video, yes, but uh, if I will upload it to YouTube, and you can increase the speed, so you can watch it in probably half an hour. Um, you might hear me, blah, 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 Khalil is speaking very fast. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, it's good to make some notes. I will not write everything, otherwise it's not a slide, it's a book. I'm reading from a book. Slides should be clean, easy, simple, bullet lines. Not text. If you make it text, you will not read it. You will not get distracted from reading it, preparing for the midterms and the final exams. So that's an anomaly. And uh, we consider also signal and noise. This is a seismic trace. That's a shaking of the ground. If you have a trace measuring, I shake the ground. The energy I send to the ground, it moves every direction. It moves every direction. If I'm the only person here, nobody is making any noises, there is no even adhan or prayers. Even prayers can make noises. <laughs> you will observe that. Once I was doing, uh, last, last semester I was doing a seismic acquisition, the students observed during the adhan, we were acquiring the data, they observed some noises. So this is a clean, good, it means that I'm the source, no noises, no external noises, that's good data. Whereas, what's the difference between this? This is a noise. That's a noise. This is the wanted part. This is this. The noise itself includes the wanted part, and it includes some unwanted part, the noise. How to remove it? You need to appreciate, to determine what exactly is the noise. What is the characteristics of the noise? Will not go in this course. I will not go into details how to recognize the noise and etc. and etc. Because students, geophysics students, they take advanced courses in uh, seismic data processing, uh, seismic interpretation. Other courses applied one, applied two, applied three. Uh, applied one is seismology. Seismic in general applied two is electrical, electromagnetic methods. Uh, and applied three is graphite and magnetic methods. So in those courses, they go in detail what are different noises, how to remove those noises, whereas this is just an example. So here are the noises. Here assume I'm doing, for example, a magnetic survey. That's a magnetic survey. There is no noise. It's very clean. It's, it's the result of the ETH. Truly, that's the result of the ETH. You see these anomalies? What is bringing this anomaly? This small anomaly again, dike, dike, dike. Why, why it's going down like that? Why the anomaly or the response is decreasing because of this, this granitic feature? This is the dike, this is the granite. Granite probably have a layer, uh, a lower uh, magnetization than the sedimentary rocks. These are what? Layered, what, what? Where we see layering, in what kind of rocks? Igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary. So these are sedimentary rocks. They have probably a higher magnetic response, magnetic susceptibility, it's decreasing. If your objective, if you want to map the granite, what you consider those small variations, fluctuations, noises. So what is the noise and what is the signal is based on your objective, on your objective. For example, there is a technique called Maswa, Maswa in geophysics. We are solely listening to the noise. We don't want the, what we call signal in seismic reflection. Amazing. <laughs> we, we consider only, we want to lay, see the noise only. That's the noise is our signal which we considered for a long time as a noise in seismic reflection. So if, however, 
your interest is those dikes, the granite is a noise. This depression down here is the noise. So again, what, how you can determine um, the signal and, and the noise, what is the signal and what is the noise, it depends on your objective and what you are interested on. And noise, it's very important. Noise does not change only from one location to another location. Noise changes even with respect to time. It's either temporal, temporal means time, or spatial, from one location to another location. If uh, I'm trying to acquire seismic data and there is uh, some equipment or some car moving or there is some, some activity around, the farther I go away from that activity, the lesser the amount of noise. That's in terms of space. However, if I acquire it at midnight, there is no parties, probably, no activity there at midnight, the noise will be less. So I think for today that's enough. We still have 15 minutes, but I, I see some eyes closed, keep closing. <laughs> That's enough for today. Any questions so far? Oh, my recording stopped. It's not stopped, but it's not following me because maybe it sensed my hand. 